We have to open our country. You know, I, I had an expression, the cure can't be worse than the problem itself, right? I started by saying that. And I continue to say it. The cure cannot be worse than the problem itself. We got to get our country open. This is from the White House briefing just yesterday. President Trump made it very clear that he does not like the country being shut down. He doesn't like us being in quarantine. He knows it's necessary during this time period when the virus is on the rise, but he wants to get things going as quickly as possible. He wants to open the country back up. He made this similar type of statement all throughout the briefing. We're not going to destroy our country. We have to get back. Because, you know, at a certain point, you'll lose more people this way through all of the problems caused than you will with what we're doing right now. What we're doing right now, I think it's going to be very successful. But you know what? I don't know. We're going to we have a big decision to make at a certain point. OK, we have a big decision to make. We cannot let this continue. So at a certain point, some hard decisions are going to have to be made. This is the big question a lot of people have. How long is this quarantine going to last? How long is the economy going to be shut down? As an investor, that is our main question. When will the economy open back up? Well, what I'm going to do in this video is make the assumption that it's going to be a very long time, that we're going to have a prolonged shutdown. And with that assumption, we're going to look at 10 companies that in the worst circumstances will continue to pay their dividends. These are 10 companies that the economy can stay shut down for months on end, and they'll remain profitable and continue to pay dividends in those circumstances. Okay, so we're looking at my portfolio. Like I said, we're going to be going over 10 companies that the main focus, the, the primary thing that we're looking at here is dividend sustainability. We have a market where a lot of companies are going to be cutting their dividends. I'm going to outline 10 companies that I do not think they will cut their dividends during this downturn, even if it lasts a very long time. Now, I will give the disclaimer, anything can happen. I don't have a crystal ball. There could be some type of event that causes these to cut their dividends, but I think they are amongst the most unlikely to do so. So let's go ahead and jump into the first one here. It's in healthcare. Merck is company number one. This is a company that I've been loading up on with this downturn. Merck is a healthcare company. It's a pharmaceutical company. If you don't know what it does, it creates solutions and treatments for all sorts of health issues. It says the company offers therapeutic and preventative agents for cardiovascular, type 2 diabetes, chronic hepatitis C virus, HIV-1 infection, intra-abdominal fungal infection, insomnia, inflammatory disease, neuromuscular blocking agents, cholesterol-modifying medicines, and antibacterial, and so on and so forth. The company creates treatments for a host of different illnesses and diseases that people face. It has a very diversified revenue stream. Amongst their treatments, they have Keytruda, which from what I've read, is performing very well. It's doing a good job of treating cancer, and they're trying to expand that to different cancer applications. So this is one of their biggest growth drivers. They have exclusivity on Keytruda until 2008. So they have dibs to this treatment for a long time, as well as they have a pipeline of lots of different drugs and treatments that seem promising. Now, on top of that, Merck is rated a 99 from Simply Safe Dividends. 99 is the most they give. They never give 100 because there's always a chance a company can cut their dividend even if they have no reason to, they could just decide to. So Merck has a 99. This is the safest rating they give. CFRA analysts currently have a strong buy on it. That's the rating they give. We can also look at Merck's dividend history. It's pretty clear they have a strong commitment to paying their dividend. So this is something that I doubt the management will try to give up anytime soon. Now, as you can see, it has come down a little bit in price over the past month, just like most companies have. It's offering a 3.2% dividend yield right now which if you compare that to the past year, it's quite a bit better. People are paying more money for this company a couple months ago. So this is a company I think is a pretty good deal right now. It's not an outrageously undervalued deal. It hasn't fallen that much because it is a safer pick right now. It's more insulated from the current threats. So Merck is a company that I have been investing more in over the past couple weeks, and I'll continue to during this downturn. Now, the next one is a new holding to my portfolio. In fact, I'm switching out of one holding and I'm introducing this one. I am moving from Coca-Cola to Pepsi. I know that this might cause some controversy. I'm sorry if you love Coca-Cola drinks, if Diet Coke is your favorite drink. There's a couple reasons that I'm doing this. And what I don't want to give off is the impression that Coca-Cola is not a good holding. This is a, a case where both these companies are going to do fine. They're both going to do fine. Looking at the differences between the two, I'll outline first of all, a couple reasons why I went with Pepsi over Coca-Cola and why I think Pepsi is a company that will not cut its dividend during this downturn. Reason number one, Pepsi has a 93 safety rating from Simply Safe Dividends. 
Coca-Cola has an 80 safety rating. Both of these are good, anything above 80 is very solid, but Pepsi does edge out Coca-Cola a little bit with their dividend safety. Now we can look at a couple other things here. Pepsi has a strong buy recommendation from CFRA, but so does Coca-Cola. So both of them have pretty safe dividends. Pepsi edges out Coca-Cola a little bit right now, which isn't a big deal. And both of them have five-star recommendations from CFRA. So, so far they're about neck and neck. Let's go ahead and look at some of the actual stats with the companies. Right now with the current price, Pepsi has a 3.18% dividend yield. Coca-Cola has a 3.71% dividend yield. So Coca-Cola's is slightly higher. But if we look at the payout ratio, Pepsi's is 65% while Coca-Cola's is 78%. So Pepsi does have a lower payout ratio, which is a good thing for Pepsi. Now, if we look at the dividend history, we have Pepsi here, and as you would expect, it is a phenomenal dividend history. The same thing can be said for Coca-Cola's, a dividend history with just a steady increase of dividends. Now, just looking at this data, you can see both companies are really good. They're both very solid picks. I don't think you can really choose wrong with one over the other. The reason that I'm changing to Pepsi, the reason that I'm going with this company is for a couple small reasons. One of them is the recent dividend growth rate. You have Pepsi here who has grown its dividend for the past three years at a rate of 8%. Last year, they grew it at 5.7%. Over the past five years, they've grown it at 8.41%. Compare that to Coca-Cola and all the numbers are lower. So Coca-Cola seems like its growth rate is slowing down quite a bit while Pepsi is maintaining its dividend growth rate. So that's one reason is the rate of the dividend growth. Another one is the portfolio of the company. I know that Coca-Cola owns a lot of good products, but Pepsi owns Frito-Lay, which I think is a really good brand to own. And they're doing acquisitions like buying Rockstar Energy Drinks, which I think is another good acquisition. So I think that Pepsi's being a little bit more aggressive. So overall, I've liked the decisions Pepsi's management has done. I think that they're being a little bit more aggressive with their acquisitions and with their expansion. I think it has a little bit more diversified of a portfolio. Coca-Cola does have some good things going for it. It has bigger distribution. It has more exposure to international and emerging markets. There's some good things with Coca-Cola too. But having said that, I'm going to be moving over to Pepsi and I'm going to try to build up this holding pretty aggressively during this downturn. This is another case where I see a company that I think is at a good deal that is mostly insulated with the current issues we're facing. Business might be slow down with Pepsi, but I think it will continue paying its dividend during this downturn. Number three is Aflac. This is about as boring of a company as it gets. It's an insurance company. There's not much excitement with this company, but in times like this market, sometimes it's good to have companies that are very boring. You want boring companies that pay you boring dividends that grow over time and the company appreciates in value. That's what Aflac does. It has a 99 dividend safety score. Its current dividend yield is 3.3%. They grow at like 7% every year, and the current yield is much higher than its five-year average. The dividend growth on this company has been completely phenomenal. The management is dedicated to continue paying the dividend, and the payout ratio is 25%. That's very low. They spend a small amount of their cash on dividends. So that's it. Aflac is a boring company with a stable business model that pays dividends and raises them every single year. And I think that there is very little chance of them cutting their dividend during this downturn. Next up, we have Home Depot. Ticker symbol HD. I like this company. I've owned it for a very long time. I'm going to be increasing my position in it during this downturn. It's dropped down about 20% in value since the beginning of the year. One thing you have to keep in mind with Home Depot is it's considered one of those essential businesses. So it's still open for business. And even though people have to practice social distancing, you can see that they're spreading out by six feet. Lots of people are wearing masks. Regardless, the business is open. They're still making money and people are bored out of their minds right now. So there's a lot of guys sitting at home that are used to being out and about every single hour of the day. And once they're at home for a week or two, they're finding new projects that they're saying are quote unquote essential. There's a new door handle to fix. There's a new toilet to replace. There's a new project in the backyard that are really essential to do now that you're really bored out of your mind. So a lot of people are going to Home Depot. If you visit one of these stores, it's likely pretty busy. Now what this means for investors is that the company's still making money. It still has revenue. It has money to continue to pay out its dividend no matter how long the shutdown continues. So Home Depot's sitting at an 87. That's considered very safe. On top of that, CFRA has it at a strong buy right now. It currently has a 3.2% dividend yield. The payout ratio is 58%. That's on the higher side, but they still have some wiggle room there. Here's where you see the value. This is the dividend yield over the past five years. Right now, it's currently sitting quite a bit higher than it's ever been in the past five years. So if Home Depot can continue to maintain its dividend, that means that it's probably at a decent value right now. 
So I see Home Depot as a quality brand that's 20% cheaper than it was just at the beginning of the year. It has a pretty good starting dividend yield with a very safe dividend. And it's one of the few companies considered essential that a lot of people are doing their quote unquote essential shopping there. So this is a company that I think is great to own as a dividend investor during this downturn. At number five, we have T. Rowe Price, ticker symbol T-R-O-W. This is a company I hold in financials. It's done pretty good during the downturn, a little bit better in the market. It's fallen 22% while the market's down quite a bit more. But this is a company where it has a steady stream of income. It does mostly investment management for large institutional investors and some private investors. If you have school districts or hospitals and all your employees have a 401k plan, T. Rowe might be the company that you do that 401k plan through. So they have a steady stream of income even during a pandemic, which means that their dividend is very safe right now. It has a safety score of 94. It also has a buy rating from the CFRA, four stars out of five. And the current dividend yield is 3.7%. That's a decent dividend yield. The payout ratio is 46%. And again, that leaves them a lot of wiggle room. If they end up making less money, they still have room to continue to pay their dividend. So this is another company that has a good starting yield right now. It has a resilient business model during this pandemic, and it's very unlikely to be cutting its dividend during this downturn. At number six, we have Comcast, ticker symbol CMCSA. This is a company most people know about, internet service provider, they have Xfinity, they have a streaming service. They're kind of like a utility. There's a lot of areas where if you need internet service, which most people do, you have to sign up for Comcast. The current dividend safety score is 89. I think this is about right. It could even be a little bit higher. In my opinion, the dividend on this company is very safe. There are some concerns that if enough people get unemployed, which is going to happen in the next two weeks, a lot of people will be canceling their Xfinity, they'll be canceling their cable services. I don't think that that will happen as much as people think. Because if you're unemployed and you're sitting around home all day, the one thing you're going to want is internet and TV. So I think that people want to hold on to their entertainment while they're at home. It has a strong buy recommendation from CFRA and a starting dividend yield of 2.7%. That's the downside is the starting dividend yield isn't that high. You can find a lot of companies with a higher dividend yield, but the payout ratio is very low. A 30% payout ratio is very low. So that's a pretty good dividend yield with a company that has this low of a payout ratio. Now, like a lot of companies we've been looking at, it has a phenomenal dividend history. It's been paying its dividend throughout the dot-com bubble, throughout the financial crisis, and the threats that we're facing right now, I think Comcast is still pretty insulated against them. So this is a company that I'm going to keep buying on this downturn with the assumption that there is a very limited chance of them cutting their dividend. At number seven, we have Next Era Energy, ticker symbol NEE. This is a utility company. It's one of the few companies I'm still in the green even with this downturn, because it's only fallen like 7%. So you're not getting an amazing deal here. That's part of the reason why the CFRA has a hold rating on it, not a strong buy, is because it simply hasn't fallen that much. This company's in a really strong financial position for a utility company. It currently has a dividend safety score of 99. The downside with Next Era is it's difficult to find it at a discount. Currently, it's yielding 2.3% which is a pretty low starting yield. It has a low payout ratio for a utility, 61%. One good thing about this company though, is if you compare its dividend growth rate to other utility companies, it's pretty quick. It's grown its dividend for the past 10 years, over 10% annualized. Numbers eight, nine, and 10, I'm grouping together. They're all healthcare companies. We have Johnson & Johnson, we have Medtronic, and we have United Health Group. All three of these have safety scores of 99, considered the most safe. Even given the environment, each of them is pretty insulated from the current threats of the market. Johnson & Johnson is a big pharmaceutical company. They sell a lot of essential products, a lot of family products that people are going to need, whether the economy goes into recession or not. It also has a decent starting yield, 2.83%. It has an average dividend growth rate. Medtronic is the biggest supplier of medical supplies and devices to hospitals. It again has a safety score of 99, starting dividend yield of 2.5%, which is higher than its historical average, and a dividend growth rate of 8%, which is pretty average. United Health Group faced more concerns when there was a decent chance that Bernie Sanders was going to become the nominee. Now it looks solidly like Biden is the nominee. He has not talked about Medicare for all. He wants to keep the Obamacare and, and kind of expand on that. So United Health Group is less threatened by those type of policies. Right now, the dividend safety score is a 99 on this company as well. The starting dividend yield is lower than most other companies. It's 1.8% but it has a growth rate of 20%. So it's over double as quick as other companies. You have a lower starting yield, but you have a company that grows its dividend by 20% year over year. And this company has a reliable income stream, even if we go into recession. 
So there you have it. These are 10 companies. Most of them have strong buy ratings from analysts. Most of them have a dividend safety score of 99. Most of them are either in industries where they're open right now or where they're completely insulated from the current threats. Yet almost all of them have gone down pretty substantially in value over the past two months. They've gone down 20% plus. Even in the worst case scenario people are talking about, I think that these companies will still do well. So I'm going to be purchasing these companies over the upcoming weeks. If you want more up-to-date information on every trade I do, as well as research on different companies, consider joining the Discord. There's a link in the description. Now, moving on from that, I want to talk about some news, specifically the big news, the virus going on. I know everybody's talking about it, but I heard this interview from Bill Gates. He's somebody that people consider kind of an expert on this thing because he largely predicted it in the past. There's a TED Talk where he talks uncannily about the very thing that we're facing. So here's a little clip of that. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. Not missiles, but microbes. So that was Bill Gates back in 2015 in a TED Talk. He talks about how we're unprepared for it. He talked about how we could be better prepared for it. If we would have listened to him back then, I think we would have been in a lot better shape. But at the time, it was just a TED Talk and nobody really paid too much attention to it. Now, of course, we can fast forward to now and we have the White House projecting between 100,000 and 240,000 dead from the coronavirus. Their projections, if we didn't do anything, no intervention, are in the millions. So... This is a, a pretty drastic situation. Well, Bill Gates was asked about this very projection, and I think that his answer is pretty optimistic. Well, if we do the um, social distancing properly, we should be able to get out of this uh, with a death number well short of that, uh, that without this dramatic behavior change, you could even get worse than that. But I do think uh, if we get the testing fixed, we get all 50 states involved, uh, we'll be below that. Of course, we'll pay a huge economic price in order to achieve that. So when asked about the estimates, the 100,000 to 240,000 deaths, Bill Gates says that he thinks that we'll be well below that if we implement the this, this same type of preventative measures, if we do better with testing. He thinks that we'll come in well below that. And in another part of this interview, he talks about the timeline of flattening the curve. We should, uh, towards the end of this month, start to see those numbers level off and then if we continue countrywide uh, and we're testing the right people to understand what's going on, which uh, is not the case yet, those numbers will start to go down. And then we can look at some degree of opening back up. So Bill Gates has said really two things in this interview. One of them is he thinks that we're going to come in under that projection, the 100,000 to 240,000 deaths. He thinks we'll come in well within under that projection. He also thinks that we'll see a leveling off at the end of this month, that the curve will start to flatten. And then if we continue to do well with testing and mitigation, that it will start to trend downwards. And then we can start to think about opening back up the economy. Now I'll say, I did a video about a week back saying I'm gonna be selling out of some bonds, buying about $2,000 worth of stocks every week for the next two months. That was the timeline. And my thesis for that was, I don't think the shutdown will last much longer than two months, that I think that that's about the amount of time it will last. I got a lot of comments. A lot of people left different comments saying that I'm naive, I don't know what I'm talking about, that it's gonna last much longer, four to six plus months, that I'm not taking the coronavirus seriously, that I'm downplaying it. Now we have Bill Gates saying that he believes we're gonna come in under those projections and that the shutdown will likely last around two months. That's when we'll start to think about opening things back up. So I'm okay being in agreement with Bill Gates on this subject. I feel comfortable being in alignment with his thoughts on the subject. He is the one that has a TED Talk largely predicting this whole thing in 2015. So I think that he has some level of credibility with his thoughts. So he shares similar timeline to me. I think that we will get this curve flattened sometime soon. I think in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll see a downward trend. We'll still have to be careful, but the economy needs to open up within the next couple of months. I do not see a situation where we have the economy shut down for six months. Not only do I not think the virus will last that long, but I also think the economy can't handle it. So there's two different factors. There's two different reasons why I'm investing right now. I think we'll see the opening of the economy quicker than some people assume. Okay, let's get to some questions and comments. The email address is joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. That's joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. Let me go through and read some of these comments. The first one's from Andrew. He says, this new M1 look gives me Windows 95 high contrast vibes. Let's make a bunch of type bold and hmm, fluorescent. Yep, done, push it. 
Andrew, I agree with you. It does have some Windows 95 high contrast vibes. It definitely has fluorescent in it. The blue in it is a very 95 blue. I mean, it really does look that way. So I don't mind it that much though. For some reason, it doesn't bother me that much. When I use it in the desktop, I, I like it and I like the app better than the previous version. So in my opinion, I think it's a step forward, but you're gonna see some comments. I'm gonna read here of people that have different opinions on this. Board says, I think you are delusional when you say everything is already priced in. The record high jobless didn't move the market and instead they went up. And you think this is the correct way to be? In my view, people are thinking too much like you and are gonna get burned really hard when the real crash comes in a few months. Okay, Board. I'm delusional because I think that investors are pricing in high unemployment. Let me say that uh, the whole concept of pricing something in means that most investors have a reasonable expectation that an event is going to take place. I think most people have the reasonable expectation that we are going to see incredibly high unemployment numbers. Let me ask you a question board. If you went and asked anyone, anywhere, online or in person, do we think that there's going to be a lot of unemployment in the US in the upcoming weeks? What do you think their answer will be? Do you think anyone's answer will be no? We won't see high unemployment. I'm not expecting that. Literally everybody's answer is going to be, yes, unemployment will be incredibly high. It'll be millions and millions of people unemployed. Who doesn't have the expectation that unemployment will be incredibly high? I don't know of anybody that doesn't have that expectation. Companies are closed. Millions of people are losing their jobs. Priced in means that we already have that expectation. Now, another thing that I see in some comments is things like this. You're gonna get burned really hard when the real crash comes in a few months. Was the 34% decline in the S&P 500 in one month the fake crash? Was that nothing? Are you just gonna push that to the side and say that's a, a fake crash? What does it have to be to be a real crash? An 80% decline? Does the future earnings potential of the United States need to be 20% of where it was one month ago? Is that what it needs to be to be a real crash? I'm just curious about this. Some people talk as if a 34% decline in one month of the S&P 500 is nothing. Like it's something that you shouldn't even consider as a real decline, that we have to drop 70% for it to be a real decline. Now, I think there's a high likelihood the market will continue to go down. It usually goes up in trends and down in trends. We're going down right now. We have a couple more weeks where the virus is going to continue to spread. We'll see more unemployment. We'll see bigger number of deaths with the virus. There'll be more uncertainty. So I think it's true that we're probably going to see the market go down from where it is right now. But like I outlined in this video, the companies I'm buying are with that premise, the premise that they'll continue to decline in value. I plan on holding these companies for 10 years. If they go bankrupt, if Pepsi goes bankrupt, if Home Depot goes bankrupt, if Merck goes bankrupt and J&J &J goes bankrupt, I'll have bigger issues on my hands than my portfolio value. We'll be living in a society where we'll all be facing bigger issues than our portfolio values. So I'm investing with the premise that we could see more decline, but I also think what we did experience, a 34% decline in one month, definitely qualifies as a crash. Corbin says, hey Joseph, love the show. With everything that's going on right now, how do you feel that diversification is important? As we know, one of the greatest, if not the greatest investor of all time, Warren Buffett, he was quoted to say something around the lines of, have three good companies that you know will succeed is the same as having 30 companies and hoping only a couple fail. How do you feel about this point of view? I like to look at what Warren Buffett does more than what he says. He says to buy index funds, yet he buys individual companies. He says that he doesn't focus on dividends, yet he buys a portfolio full of high paying dividend companies and he specifically negotiates high yielding deals. He says that you don't need diversification, yet Berkshire as a company owns like 50 different subsidiaries and he's publicly invested in 29 different holdings. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are some of the most well diversified investors in the market right now. The companies and the subsidiaries that they own and their public holdings are widely diversified across different sectors and different industries. He has a focus on high cash flow businesses. So I would try to mimic more of what Warren Buffett actually does than the little snippets you see cut out of different headlines. Aiden says, destroy the economy beyond repair, question mark. Okay, so this is a comment. This was left on my previous episode. It was in response to me making the point that I think if the US was to shut down the economy for a full calendar year, if we shut down the economy for that long, I think it would do irreversible damage to the economy. That's what I said. Now, Aiden is responding to that. He says, 
Destroy the economy beyond repair? Sorry, but that is hyperbolic nonsense. Germany rebuilt after World War II from absolute economic destruction and systematic dismantlement. The Allies actually tore down infrastructure after German surrender to become one of the world's most successful economies. Even with roughly 10 years, they had pretty much completely recovered under the policies of Erhard. Is COVID-19 going to dismantle factories and raise cities? Small businesses might struggle to pay rent, but who are property managers going to rent to? Who's setting up the new premises right now? It's way more nuanced than you're making it out. The economy will obviously survive. Taxes are possibly going to take a hit for years to come, and we might be pretty low on disposable income, but we aren't going back to living in caves. Try to have a little perspective. You're starting to sound as hysterical as Ackman when he phoned into CNBC the other day. All right, Aiden. Well, I appreciate the uh, comment here. I will say that I think I think that Americans will find it really comforting, the point that you bring up. If all Americans were able to hear this point, that, hey, we might destroy the economy, but Germany was able to rebuild after World War II, and it only took them 10 years to get back on their feet. That's a really motivating message. I think that that will really comfort a lot of Americans, that it might get bad if we shut down the economy for a year, but at least Germany was able to rebuild in World War II. Somehow, I really don't think that that's something that will comfort a lot of people. I don't think that most Americans want to go through what Germany did in rebuilding their economy. I'm not a history buff, but I imagine that wasn't a fun time in their history. I imagine that most Americans don't want to spend a decade rebuilding the economy. That's something I think most people don't want to go through. Now, you also bring up a couple other points. You say small businesses might struggle to pay rent. They might struggle to pay rent. Do you think if the economy was shut down a year, small businesses might just struggle to pay rent? That's a nice euphemism for saying that they would become completely insolvent, default on every type of obligation, every loan they have from the bank. They wouldn't be able to pay the landlord. They would have to default out of every type of business contract, all leased equipment. They would fire every employee. What do you mean they would struggle to pay rent? They would go bankrupt. Small businesses are not designed to go a year being shut down. None of them are set up that way. It's totally unrealistic. You also say that I'm being hysterical as Ackman, who phoned in the CNBC the other day. I don't consider a hysterical stance to think that the shutdown is going to be a couple month thing, not a year long, and that we won't destroy the U.S. economy. That's my stance. I don't think that that's hysterical. I strongly believe the U.S. will not shut down for an entire year. The amount of problems that that would cause, I think, would be very dramatic. Unlike Germany, the U.S. has $24 trillion of debt. $24 trillion of debt. Imagine how much that would go up if we were shut down for a full year. The U.S. is not designed to shut down for a year. Small businesses could not stay solvent shutting down for a year. So I don't think it's an option. I don't think it's going to happen. Even looking at all the other countries with all the graphs, the virus flattens after a couple months. So this isn't something that I think will take anywhere close to a year. Joseph, great show as usual. I always look forward to your common sense objective viewpoint. It really does cut through the chaos. That said, I've considered partially selling some bonds as well to pick up on some of these good companies and index funds that were recently at their highs. Once the switch is flipped, when does one go back to acquiring bonds? When we get back to where we were before February? Yeah, my plan is that if the market continues to fall, which a lot of people are predicting, and I don't think that that's a crazy prediction. I think there's a very high likelihood the market will fall from here. So what I plan on doing is... The type of companies that I outlined that I think can survive for a very long time, those are the type of companies that I'm going to be selling my bonds and transitioning it into those companies. It's conditional on the market falling. If the market doesn't continue to fall, I'll hang on to my bonds. And when this is all over and the market starts to recover, I will build back up my 20% bond position. So when we do get back to where we were in February, I will build back up my position. But I do know that that could take a very long time. Prasanna says... This guy is blowing his cash in the name of investment. Sell all you investment and take cash home and save yourself, boy. Prasanna, I really wanted to just highlight your comment and thank you for writing such a well-written, thought-provoking, eloquently phrased comment. You say that I should save myself, right? I should save myself. One thing I'll say is this does bring up a good point. You shouldn't be investing in the market money that you would need to save yourself. This should be money that you don't need. If my portfolio went to zero, if I lost all the money in it, my family would be just fine. We'd still be able to put food on the table. We'd still be able to pay the bills. So I'm not putting ourselves in a situation where we're dependent on our portfolio performing well to be able to survive. So I appreciate the concern, but don't worry too much about me. If the market has a really rough time over the next year or so, we're still going to be okay. 
Jeff says, hey, Joseph, if you could have known of this big downturn, would you have sold your portfolio and then rebought in at lowered prices? Of course I would. Absolutely. There's no type of religious dedication to buy and hold. There's nothing special about it that I have some certain love for it. It's not something I'd do if I thought it would actually lose me money. If I could see the future knowing there's a big downturn, I would absolutely sell out before the downturn. And then if I could see the future and know where the bottom is, I would buy back in at the bottom. I would 100% do that and probably use a lot of leverage in the process to multiply my returns. So there's no type of religious commitment to buying and holding. The only reason I do that strategy is because I'm along with everybody else. I can't see the future. I can't predict when there's going to be a 30% downturn, just like I don't know when the market's going to go back up. I hear different opinions from dozens of people every other day, and everybody has their different thoughts. But the strategy that I've picked is to buy solid companies I think will make it through the downturn, hold them as long as possible, and continue to buy them more aggressively when we see those companies at lowered prices. But if I had a crystal ball, if I could see the future, absolutely, I would take advantage of that. I think in that scenario, give me about two or three big downturns, and I would be a billionaire. So that would be an exciting thing. Unfortunately, I can't see the future, so I'm going to be sticking to the strategy I think will perform the best with the knowledge I do have. All right, well, that's a fair amount of comments and questions. If you have more questions, you can email in joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. You can also leave comments. I obviously view those as well. And if you want to check out the Patreon, you can do that. It supports the channel. It's $6 a month, build monthly. You can try it out for a month and see if you like it. A lot of people that have joined have had a lot of fun. So that's something to look at there if you're interested in discussing investments on a daily basis. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys next time.